55-year-old gentleman with uh, ETOH abuse, <laughs> HCV, uh, and cirrhosis. Uh, originally presented to the outside hospital uh, in December 2014, January 2015, with a couple of bouts of pancreatitis. Huh? Oh, I know. Oh, next slide. Okay. Um, at that time, he had developed the pseudocyst, which was confirmed on CT scan, the EGD with the EUS. Uh, he subsequently was sent to Mount Sinai after cessation of alcohol use uh, for uh, a workup for liver transplantation. Uh, as part of the workup, he had a CT angiogram. Next slide. Uh, which showed a large uh, pseudoaneurysm, uh, likely erosion of uh, pseudocyst into a portion of the splenic artery. And the red arrow, you can see a large contrast blush. And the yellow shows the, uh, the uh, body slash uh, proximal tail of the pancreas in its close association. Next slide. Uh, and this is just a close-up run as you go on. Again, you're seeing a large blush with, around the splenic artery uh, and in close proximity to the pancreas. So, next slide. In short, it's a 55-year-old male, uh, history of uh, multiple bouts of pancreatitis with pseudocyst formation and subsequent development of uh, splenic artery pseudoanalysis. So in terms of treatment options, one is to do nothing, which probably most people would not choose. Uh, the other is uh, open surgical repair. Uh, now this would involve a splenectomy and distal pancreatectomy uh, would most likely involve a lot of blood loss and in a person who may undergo liver transplantation, a uh, additional x lap prior would uh, probably not be a good idea. And the other option as you see here is uh, endovascular embolization, albeit glue, coils, or a uh, stent at one point. So this is our first run. Now this is a 110 runway 6 French guiding catheter. This is going through a 6 French slender sheath, uh, which we have in the wrist. And we, we, in retrospect, we probably should have accessed slightly higher up on the wrist here uh, because we have the guide cath hub. Now remember, this is a 110 guide, but the good thing is it actually uh, is sitting pretty well into the proximal splenic, so we were happy with the purchase there. Uh, we used a stiff glide wire to sort of work our way around using a 125 support catheter, and then we did our first angiogram. We did multiple obliques, uh, and we see this sort of a uh, very large pseudoaneurysm, and there is a neck here. I don't know if you guys can appreciate yeah. that. Go to the next row. Yeah. yeah, so we got better purchase, and you can see that oh, yeah. right there. Wow. Let's go back a few, right there. <laughs> it's chatting in there. Yeah. So at this point, uh, we thought that we would maybe be able to get a little bit more distal than we, we, we had with the guide, but we weren't able to get further out based on the length. So this is definitely one of the limitations of doing this transradial is being able to get pretty far out into the splenic to support the procedure. So what we did instead was we took a 155 2.4 uh, uh, direction microcatheter and we, uh, we tried to get into that neck. Let's go to the next run. So we did a few obliques. No, next well. run. And there we go getting into that. And so at this point, we put about 7 to 10 coils. We've used uh, 18 and 20 18 and twenty interlocking concerto coils. So at this point, we're going to finish up with, you can see we have a little bit of a nest there. And the idea here was to sort of just create a nidus for clot to form, whether we coil across or not. Mm. Um, and that, I think, we accomplished. Well, I think no matter what you do, you should coil across, right? I mean, because you don't know, because we've seen this before, especially m not necessarily on the peripheral side, because we just... Yeah don't see a lot of these, but on the, the, on the neuro side, right, if you just try to pack a pseudoaneurysm with coils, it, it just sort of, you still get flow, it pressurizes, and you get this weird mess of yeah. coils pushed just away, and then it's still an open pseudoaneurysm, you know, so. Yeah, we probably have to pull this coil out because it's probably not, uh, we'll, we'll pull it out, let's pull it out, we'll flush again. But that's the advantage of using a, a detachable coil, yeah, is that when you do run into unexpected, uh, uh, resistance, you can always uh, pull it out and as you recommended to reflush. So we uh, measured the size of the distal splenic artery. It's probably about uh, 10 millimeters. Uh, you guys can appreciate that there. So we'll probably put in a, a big, uh, like an 18 coil uh, right past this and then we'll, we'll coil across the, the origin of the pseudo and then we'll be done. Yeah. Let's get some smaller coils. I've got so, a So, you know, one of the things about splenic em embolization and, and 
I've sort of learned my lesson by putting in too small of a coil as my first coil, and you guys have probably seen this as well. It tends to fly distal, and then you sort of have to start over. Yeah. Only when I you think do that's it, a right? nice frame. <laughs> <laughs> I've um, never seen that know. happen ever, actually. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay with the way that looks. Are you guys satisfied with that? Yeah. Yeah, so we're just going to put smaller coils in now, and then and that will be the frame. So th I think this will allow us to use less coils by having a frame there. Yeah. Beautiful. So the other thing that we're going to do now, uh, mm -hmm. we're going to try to, we're going to put the microcatheter a little bit further into that nest there. And we're going to put in some uh, nester coils, some thick nester coils to sort of form a little plug. I think yeah. that'll be a nice, uh, a nice way to sort of fill that gap. Yeah, again, I mean, it's one of those things. Once you form the cage, the, the smaller coils aren't going to really fly through that cage. Right. Yeah, this is actually... So we're going to try to advance the microcatheter a bit so we can fill up that gap, and then uh, we'll continue I to coil really actually just locked it down uh, that further back. knot that you made there. Yeah. Can I have three, please? Hey, Aaron, can yeah. you um, inject the guide and just see if there's flow through your outflow? Because yeah, I, I, think, I think that really answers the question of whether or not you can use liquid agents here. Yeah. Anybody in the audience use liquid agents for visceral pseudoaneurysms? There's not a lot of interest in this concept in the audience, Aaron. Still some flow. That actually looks... That's not flow through it. That's flow... No, I think that's flow around Let's it. Let's see. Well, we see some flow through. And we also see flow... You see the those short through. gastric yeah. collaterals. It's anterior yeah. flow. Favorite coils. No, I do like the nesters. It's very we, can, we can focus in on here. Should we flush these or push them with the wire? What do you guys think? Just push push them. them. I say push, push them. them. You have a nice nest. It'll catch on the nest. I'll just blow them in. Here. I, I wouldn't blow it in. Well, I mean, <laughs> just uh, with the saline. Yeah. <laughs> I would inject it with saline. How about that? Yeah, I like that one. All right. That, <laughs> that looked pretty good. Let's I do agree. a couple more of those. You know, I feel like we have a nice space there, a nice cage. I think this is a good way to do it. One of the disadvantages of using coils, obviously, in these types of cases is cost, right? We always think about that now. And so a case like this, you could use... Potentially, you could use uh, 20, 30 coils in a case like this. So we really want to try to think about that at least as best we can. Aaron, I, I you know, Mystics, I was running back over here. What did you use to trap the, the uh, outflow? Which, which, which system did you, did you use? So right now, Rob, we have a 6 French J, uh, 110 JR4 that goes through a 6 French Slender. And then through that, we used an Aqua Tempo, but the Aqua Tempo didn't make much, uh, much more purchase than we had. Um, but the outflow flow coil was an interlock, yeah, I believe. The first outflow 18, was an right? interlock. We also used the concerto. So we have two, two framers in there, and then we basically just started pushing in these, these cook coils here. And so they're sort of filling the gap very nicely. Let's get a couple more of those. He's not out of the micro yet. I bet you're going to be done in probably five more coils. I hope so. If Nick can, uh, <laughs> can load them fast enough. Well, he's going to get them out first. Okay. <laughs> The nice thing about these coils is they're, they have a lot of fiber on them, so they thrombose very quickly. We need to pull back a little so bit. I, yeah, I think uh, Nora mentioned it. In terms of technique, uh, do you uh, pull back the microcatheter slowly as you're injecting these, uh, and, and when do you do that? Yeah, you've got to reduce some of that tension. Sorry, was he talking to me? So obviously we want to sort of get as close as we can into that nest. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, you, you know, with pushable coils, it's always a little unpredictable. Uh, we're not getting a lot of, uh, you know, recoil when we inject. But I think what you're getting at is should we pu be pushing these with a wire to sort of keep the system more stable? Trying to ask here, Ed? I'm sorry? Yeah, you're asking exactly. how much uh, recoil we're getting when we flush them in? Recoil and also tension in the system, you know? You There's a, a little bit, but I'll be honest, it's not as bad as you, would, as you would think based on this anatomy. Okay. And I think part of that is because we have such a stable system in the proximal splenic. Going into the pseudoaneurysm. It's in the pseudoaneurysm. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to put the tail in there and then pull the microcatheter back and let it prolapse into the proximal artery. So let's see if can Nora can, can do that. Um, and then, then we'll do a run and see where we're at. Right there. So we're going to try to just let it lay out right there. Uh, that's perfect. If you yeah. can get it to stay there, that's, that's an excellent proximal seal area. No, that was nice. And then if we could much. focus on, the, uh, on Nora's Sorry. hands here, we're going to break it. Uh, so once we get this fully deployed, 
you know, you, we can break these with the handle, but we're going to show how we break it without the handle. I know people in the audience were talking about this earlier, so we figured we would. Uh, so this is off-label use. It's very important to understand this. This is not when the IFU, you're not supposed to, to break the coil pusher. Um, so in order to break, you crack at the level of the filament back and forth, and then you actually just pull. The so filament no, will pull out. Can you so see Nora, my where's, hands? Where's the filament on the coil? Because you know it has those black marks, right? Right. So you go to the more proximal marker on it, you crack back and forth once, and then you gently tug back, and you can actually see the filament pull out. I think it may actually be so thin that you can't see it on screen. It's roughly the size of a piece of a hair. We can Maybe see it. Sort of. Can you uh, also see, show though. us the, the wire where the black uh, marking is yes. for the audience? So here's the distal black marker, which is the longer one. And when it's intact, there is the more proximal black marker, which is the shorter one, yeah. and it cracks roughly in the middle. Can you see? Sorry, yeah. I'm just yep, trying to angle my fingers. There you go. The we camera. can see that now. Yeah. You can see that? So yeah. that's where it breaks, and then the filament will slowly pull out. Once you've pulled the filament out, you know you're disconnected, and then you can pull your whole system. Step on run. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Can we get the fluoroscopy screen again? Great. That looks great. Not bad. And then now you start to see the short gastric collaterals filling so, the distal spleen. So what's, what's, what's really important here as a, as a sort of final angiogram, and I, I think it's pretty you know, easy to determine that you're, you're actually finished here, but what I typically do is I'm, I'll not only look at it on DSA, what's really nice is that um, the, the um, splenic collaterals are finish, uh, filling the distal splenic artery, but I'll typically look at it unsubtracted. So if, if you could ask the... Uh, that the a technologist who's in the room to make it an unsubtracted image. What you really want to look at is you want to see if there's any contrast to pacifying the coil mass. Uh, so what we're going to do now before we, before we finish is we're going to pull the microcatheter out. So Nick's going to pull the microcatheter out. And we're just going to show a, a general technique um, how we actually pull catheters out from a radial access. So do we have a pull. Benson wire somewhere? Yes, we do. There was some questions from the audience earlier. Uh, I got a few texts, so I, people had some questions on how to actually pull catheters out. Uh, the, the, one, the one thing we always worry about with, with radial axis is, is there a potential for vertebral artery injury? Uh, so we're going to aspirate the guide a bit just to make sure there's no blood clots in it. And then we're going to send the, the, the Benson wire in, pull back into the aorta. Yeah. And then we're just going to pull it back over the, over the arch slowly just to make sure that there's no issue. And so I think this adds an element of safety to these procedures. So whether we're doing a TACE or a Y90, so let's pull it out of the splenic before you put the wire in. And then we're going to just sh show, put, the, put a little more wire out. Okay. And we're just going to pull the whole system back as a unit. And so it just keeps you from sort of flicking anything into the vertebral. We don't typically do this uh, because we don't need to in most cases. But it is good to see what's going on in the wrist. Still there. <laughs> With the, 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 the question is, in a Barbo B patient, is the radial artery bigger or the ulnar artery bigger? It's usually still the radial artery, still the bigger one. Well, now it's <laughs> going to be... Well, That's here they're equal. Radial. They're pretty close. So, what do you guys think? I think I that's about right. I think it's, it's either the same or the radial is slightly bigger. Yeah. So, we're going to... Yeah. just want to show the perfusion from the ulnar. So you guys see all those collaterals filling the Palmar arch there. Yeah, I mean, you also got flow around your sheath too, which is nice, so. Yeah. 